Um, okay, so great to be here. Um, we're doing a tag team to talk about Open Force Field and what Open Force Field is up to and where it's headed. And um, it's great to be here in person after so long. Um, just before this, we some of us came from what's called the alchemistry meeting, which is a meeting on free energy calculations, finding free energy calculations. For those who don't know, this is a starting to be a key tool used in the pharmaceutical industry to help guide early stage drug discovery. And force fields are a key ingredient used in those calculations. So that's part of what open force field is about. At the last alchemistry meeting, which happened five years ago because this pandemic intervened, open force field had not yet launched as a funded project. Um, it started in October, 2018. At this meeting, it was the most widely used public force field, at least by count of mentions in talks. So that was a big, exciting, uh, an exciting change for us. A brief timeline, um, in, January, in, in 2016, Chris Bailey arrived at UC Irvine in my lab on sabbatical to start um, essentially getting things going for open force field. And I know the exact date because at the moment I greeted him, my wife in labor and our first, our, our last daughter was born that day. So open force field is exactly that old. Um, and then in 2018, it launched as a funded project with pharma folks joining on, coordinated initially through Virginia Tech at Molsey. And so OMSF didn't exist at that point. It was created later to help facilitate things like this. So that's how old my daughter was at this point. And so, you know, here we are today. Um, we have our first post-COVID meeting. Many of us are meeting each other for the first time, which is cool. Um, and, you know, this seems open force field seems to be the most accurate public force field. And so here's my daughter now. So she reads, making real strides. Um, you'll hear more, I'm just gonna give some highlights of things you can hear more about or you can talk to us about. Um, and then Jeff and Lily will come up and tell you some more about what's going on. One, one thing we've done is quite a bit of benchmarking of finding free energy calculations with open force field across a wide range of targets. And, and David Hahn and Vitas who are here have done some really nice work on this, cross comparing a bunch of different force fields, looking at all of these different targets around here, something like 1100 binding free energy calculations. And it looks good in general. There's room for improvement still, but it's, it's good. And people are, as a result, people are using it a lot. At the same time, you can take that analysis and do a deep dive to see how are generations of the force field changing accuracy. Um, there was actually quite a bit of this at the recent alchemistry meeting and a big picture, like as we go from subsequent versions that are close to each other, people don't immediately see, it, see a huge impact on binding free energy calculations because there's a lot of sources of noise in those. But if you dive in really deeply as David has done in significance test things and look at can you see an impact of changes in parameters that are used a lot in the free energy calculations? So this is after some nice significance testing and the bars here go up if going from 1.0 to 2.0 make the results worse and down if they make it better. So you can see that almost all of the changes from our 1.0 to 2.0 version made the binding free energies more accurate. This is after careful significance testing. So we are making headway even in binding free energy calculations where it's there's more noise. We see a lot of headway with, this in, with respect to quantum chemical geometries and energetics. Um, there's also some great tools that have come out that you can use, um, and you'll hear more about these. For example, Bespoke Fit. Um, Danny Cole will be talking about this in the Open Force Field session tomorrow. This fits custom torsions uh, for specific molecules or chemical series. Um, so on the, on the top right, you can see a graph looking at the original torsional profile for this molecule in orange, and then the quantum profile and the refit profile with the spoke fit in blue. Um, so you can use a fast semi-empirical quantum method or your quantum method of choice to refit the torsions. And it really does seem to improve accuracy at the bottom right is impact on binding free energy calculations for one particular system. <clears throat> and Danny, I think will tell us more tomorrow about what goes on here. There's a fragmentation of the molecules and then um, fitting torsions that will work along a chemical series and it does improve accuracy there's some numbers at the bottom right um, rms error that is just that right column and so you can see bespoke fit at the bottom right has way better um, accuracy rms error on torsion profiles so you can hear more about that if you want also the infrastructure we built 
as part of the consortium ends up being used and for interesting things far beyond what we're doing. Um, as an example, Danny Cole's group with their own funding has been able to build a double exponential functional form force field, a general force field. So a major change in functional form, fit it with the same infrastructure, test it with the same infrastructure, whole water model and everything. So this is something that might've taken 10 years of work for somebody to do before, and they've done it in a short period of time. There's a simulation with that at the top right, at the bottom left is a bunch of solvation free energy calculations done with this force field. So now I can use it to do solvation free energy calculations and cross compare with more conventional functional forms. Um, there's also where Ryan Cases group at NC State um, looking at a polarizable exponential 6810 force field. And um, you'll be able to hear more from them about that in a publication soon, I expect. But, um, they've been able to make a general force field that does that and test it on a number of things, including enthalpies of vaporization. Um, on the right, it looks better than Sage there. This is not something that our mainline open force field is expecting to do to go towards soon, but it's cool because people are starting to use this infrastructure to accelerate force field science in a way we haven't seen before. And then Willa Wang and Mike Gilson's group will be talking tomorrow about um, adding polarization, simply direct polarization. Um, to our, a model and then refitting force fields with that, again, using the same infrastructure. And so on the right is a graph with um, dielectric constants calculated from this. And on SAGE, SAGE is the left, right is the polarizable model, so it improves dielectric constants a lot. Um, we I recently, we recently put together a mission statement, and here it is. You don't have to read the whole thing, but part of the idea of at least the industry funded part, the consortium, is to keep making steady progress in improving the accuracy of force fields. We've run into problems occasionally where we have an idea and we pursue that idea a whole lot and invest a lot of effort into it, and maybe in the end it doesn't work out. So we're trying to focus a lot in the coming year on benchmarking. So you have ideas, your ideas have to clear the hurdles and the, the ideas that don't clear the hurdles are gonna get you know, neglected or dropped even if they seem to be really good ideas before you tried them. Benchmarking then is critical so that well, we don't make philosophy-driven choices, we make data-driven choices. Um, now we do continue to make steady progress in force field accuracy and that benchmarking is gonna help us systematize things like this. this is, a comparison we often run looking at uh, cumulative distribution function for small molecule RMSDs or geometry errors relative to quantum chemistry. So lower is better. And you can see that as we go across subsequent versions of the force field, we're making smaller and smaller geometry errors or we're reducing the scale of geometry errors. And the same thing tends to hold true for other metrics. You'll also hear in, in this talk and in what's coming about other cool things you can do or directions we're headed. For example, we now can handle proteins within our infrastructure, which makes it easier to simulate proteins that can complexes. Um, and we're, as part of heading towards easy handling of biopolymer, covalent modifications of biopolymers, um, Lily is building out a graph network charge model that can do really fast assignment of charges, even for large molecules. Uh, which will have some important applications. So you'll get to hear more about the roadmap of this to come. I think we're really at the point in open force field where we've made clear progress. It's exciting, people are really starting to use it, but there's so much still to do. At some level, we feel like we're still just getting going um, as much as I'd like to be done working on force fields and just go and use them. Um, so you're gonna hear more about this, but over to Jeff to talk about what we've done so far. Thank you. And can I check, uh, how is my audio over there in the back of the room? Can everybody hear? Okay. Um, am I clearly being amplified by the microphone? I think there clearly is. I think it might be used, but it's quiet. Okay. Uh, then I'll use, I'll use my outdoor voice as well. Uh, great. Hi. I'm Jeff Wagner. I'm the infrastructure lead at Open Force Field. And in this part of the talk, I'm going to try to convince you of three things. I'm going to try to convince you that our models work. 
I'm going to try to convince you that people are actually using them in the real world. And I'm going to try to convince you that you should be using them too. So I'm going to start by explaining how we make our force fields. When we go to fit a force field, we start with an initial guess shown on the left. In this case, this is a figure from the SAGE paper explaining that we began with OpenFF 1.3.0 Parsley. Uh, and then we did a refit to uh, two sources of data. One source of data was condensed phase information. So densities of uh, mixtures and pure compounds, as well as enthalpies of mixing for compounds. And so we take our initial guess of a force field. We go pack these boxes to match the experimental, uh, experimental solutions, make sure, you know, simulate these boxes to see what density we get, see if that agrees with experiment, and then try varying the non-bonded parameters up and down a little bit, redoing this, seeing if things get better or worse, and improving the force field sort of by a gradient descent method. Once we'd finished that non-bonded refitting, we then went to a large data set of QM optimized molecules and their associated energies. And we tested whether the MM force field could match the correct ranking of conformers and the energy differences between them and also their geometries. Uh, and we vary all the parameters up and down a little bit. These would be the bonds, the angles, the torsions, and the impropers. And we'd use this again to do a gradient descent for the valence terms. And finally, we'd get a release candidate of a force field out of this optimization process. With this release candidate, we would go and benchmark it. We would do benchmarks similar to how we did the QM training and the condensed phase training, but just on data that wasn't used in the training. And also we would do benchmarking using uh, free energy calculations. Here's an example of what the condensed phase fitting looks like. Um, these are two types of properties that we fit to. On the left, we have enthalpies of mixing, and on the right, we have densities. The blue series is the initial force field, parsley 1.3.0, and the orange series is SAGE 2.0.0. Uh, and you can see before the refitting, for example, on the right, densities were being systematically underestimated up at that high range. And with the end of the refitting, everything was pretty much on the center line. The enthalpies of mixing are a little bit, well, more mixed, but uh, statistically you can look at it and the, the training did improve that. And so we're not aiming here to, to fit protein ligand binding for energies. We're just taking these small, carefully measured interactions and training our force field to get them right. Here's an example that Mobley showed of the, uh, the QM benchmarking. Uh, and so here, this is using the industry data set or the industry training, uh, industry benchmarking set uh, that many of you participated and contributed molecules to. And here we're showing a cumulative distribution function of when we start with a QM optimized geometry and then we feed that into an MM optimization using a number of different force fields, what happens during that MM optimization? Does the MM force field recognize that it's at a minimum and stay there? In which case the minimization would result in an RMSD of zero? Or does it not think that it's at a minimum and the MM potential energy surface has a minimum somewhere else and it wanders off? So a perfect force field here would have a vertical line basically uh, at zero and then a horizontal line at y equals one. That would mean that everything sticks right at the QM minimum uh, when you reminimize it using an MM force field. We don't have perfect force fields, but what you can see is that through successive generations of training our force fields, we do manage to capture more area under the curve. That means that larger and larger fractions of the 70,000 conformer data set are remaining close to their QM minima. And well, great, we can get uh, some densities right, we can get some enthalpies of mixing right, we can, we can get conformers right, and maybe that's useful for some users who really want uh, to use OpenFF for those applications, but I think the majority of people are interested in protein ligand binding free energies. This is another figure from the SAGE paper showing performance on a large set of protein ligand binding free energies. I believe it's almost 600 ligands and 20 different proteins. And it's showing that SAGE is an improvement over Parsley that we're now uh, you know, among the best for open source, uh, openly available force fields. And that we're approaching the performance of sort of long lived commercial force fields as well. So this is exciting. Oh, and on the left, that's root mean squared error. You want that to be small. On the right, that's Kendall's tau. That's how well you rank the conformers in agreement with their experimental ranking. You want that to be large. Uh, and so you can see kind of things descending on the left and things ascending on the right. Importantly, it shows that in successive iterations of our force field fitting, 
we are seeing improvements, even in things that we didn't fit to protein ligand binding for energy. We fit to boring things, but it turns out that we're getting protein ligand binding for energy is more correct. And you'll notice that the numbers on some of these plots have been jumping around. Uh, sometimes I'm talking about Sage 2.0.0 and sometimes 2.1.0, and that's because 2.1.0 just came out last week, so we don't have all of the benchmarks run on it yet. Um, but Sage 2.1.0 is really exciting because instead of taking these things that we're already doing quite well on and trying to get them, you know, 0.1 angstroms better, uh, our fitting team for the last two years has been getting reports of O-sulfonamides are tricky, O-phosphoruses in certain situations have trouble. You know, I'm seeing problems with these specific chemistries and we've had a lot of really helpful feedback. And using that, we've expanded our, our training set for the force field such that it covers a bunch of chemistry. So some of our parameters we were refitting, but some of them we didn't have enough training data on. So we, we weren't doing, and over the years, we've been generating more of this training data and we're getting more user uh, reports. And so Sage 2.1.0 focuses on the outliers. It's the culmination of people identifying these chemistries and us you know, smelling funny things in corners of chemical space. And this is due to a huge amount of work, by the way, from the people on the right, Pavan, Trevor, Chapin, and Josh, who are all gonna be giving talks later on. But in particular, it's important to note that there's a lot more parameters included in the training. That means that we're relying a lot less on just whatever values were in the previous force field or what we're gonna keep. Um, and especially we've been haunted uh, on the bottom here, we can see there's the sulfonamides. We've been haunted for a long time by problems with geometries of sulfonamides. And this cleans up a lot of those. Over here on the bottom right, these are plots of two angles. These are three atom angles that get used in sulfonamides. And before and after uh, the changes that were made in OpenFF 2.1.0, you could see that things that were assigned A31 would sometimes deviate from uh, their expected geometry and things that would uh, were assigned A32 would deviate. And they would deviate systematically in one direction or the other. Not like, oh, you know, it's just chemistry is complicated. It's like, no, things are systematically going into the wrong bin here. And so Pavan and Trevor in particular did a lot of work to redefine the SMARTS patterns so that things are now falling into the correct bins. Uh, if you wanna hear more about this, Pavan's gonna be giving a talk tomorrow uh, in the open force field room from 4 to 4.25 p.m. And indeed, this is cool. We said, oh, we're going to go outlier hunting, you know, and we can make up all these narratives about what we're trying to do. But when we actually look at the outcome, this is uh, one, that experiment again, where we take a QM optimized conformer and then we re-minimize it in MM and we check to see how far it wanders away from that QM minimum. And uh, a perfect method, again, would just have everything in the leftmost bin, all the RMSDs would be zero, the MM stays right where the QM says a minimum is, but that's not real. However, what's cool here is we see that leftmost bin, the thing that we weren't focusing on, the things that we were already doing do on, well on, that didn't, get, that didn't get a whole bunch of new members. What we did get is an increase in the lower range bin that comes at the expense of just taking a little bit off of all of these large outliers at high RMSD. So these things that we were doing exceptionally poorly on before, we've now gone and wrangled all of those in. We brought the flock back into a lower bin. So again, if you wanna hear more about this and the process behind it, definitely come to Pavon's talk tomorrow. David Mobley also mentioned bespoke fit. This is when you wanna spend a little bit of extra computational time to get an extra accurate uh, result from your calculation you can use OpenFF bespoke fit. And this will take a molecule of interest and it will add terms on top of the general force field. So an input for bespoke fit would be Sage 2.1.0 and your molecule of interest. And bespoke fit will produce a new force field that's Sage 2.1.0 with additional torsion terms on the end of it for the torsions in this molecule of interest. And it will identify the torsions, it will fragment up that molecule, it will do QM drives of those torsions to get a really accurate surface, and then it will train the new terms that get added to the force field based on those uh, QM results. And does it work? Well, yeah. Uh, again, you don't just have to believe that, oh, if the QM geometry matching gets better, if the QM energy matching gets better, then probably something good happens downstream. No, uh, Josh and Danny and Simon really went out and tested this, I believe, with the help of David Hahn, and the free energy results get better. On the right is the results of uh, a version of Parsley that was available at the time that was extended with bespoke terms. And on the left is just uh, the version of Parsley without the bespoke terms. 
and you do indeed see that many of like basically all of the metrics quality get better so if you have the time to do bespoke fitting uh you can check that out i believe we have an industry speaker this afternoon william Wu, who's going to talk about some of his experiences doing that and so I hope you now believe that our models work. And now I'm going to try to convince you that people are actually using it. So it's not that we have some model that only we can run because it's so Byzantine. Uh, I'm going to show a couple of use cases. So one is from, we, we had this talk in an all hands meeting came out of the blue for me uh, from uh, Tobias Hoopner. And he talked about using different small molecule force fields to investigate crystals, uh, small molecule crystal structures. And he, he tried a whole bunch of them and yeah, Parsley and Sage end up working really well in this situation. Again, something that we hadn't trained the force field for, it wasn't anything that we had identified as a big use case, but he used it and it's a general force field and it did a generally good job. Um, if you want to come to Tobias's talk, it's gonna be on a different topic actually, but he's a really smart guy and he's talking tomorrow in the open force field room from 11.10 to 11.30. We also, uh, you've probably heard from us that we're coming out with this amazing rosemary force field in the future. It's gonna be a self-consistent protein, small molecule force field such that uh, if you have some modification to your protein, the small molecule parameters will just fit in there. Uh, it, the, the parameters will basically be indistinguishable. And it's, it's a huge amount of work and you're gonna hear about this uh, in one of the talks tomorrow as well. But in the meantime, We've been joking, you know, oh, if you wanted to do something in a pinch, you could put together a Franken force field. Take something that wasn't meant to be combined and just use the Smirnoff hierarchy rules to combine it. And Josh and I, uh, Josh Mitchell and I on the bottom there, were having a check-in last year. And it, we were just kind of joking around and we ended up staying two or three hours past the end of our check-in. And we put together a little notebook of, yeah, let's just Frankenstein together Amber's FF14SB and Sage and just see what happens. And we ended up with a notebook that can parameterize post-translation modified proteins. Uh, and during our, our workshop push, we went ahead and, and did a, a workshop, I think around October, which Rebecca Alford attended. And she started using this workflow. Uh, and I'm really excited to hear where this has gone. So uh, Rebecca's at, at Jensen, I believe. And she's gonna be talking about her experiences using this for post-translation modified protein modeling this afternoon. Also, apparently people like free energy workflows. And I have i had never run a free energy calculation in my life before I came to open force field and I still haven't, but apparently other people do it. And we are being used in an enormous number of free energy calculations. Um, this is just this is just stuff that came in my inbox in the last like three weeks, by the way. There's so much of this happening. And so if you're wondering, you know, are there free energy frameworks that can use open force field? Do they exist? Uh, yes, they very much do. And uh, people are using them, people have been using them. Uh, and so if you want to be running free energy stuff with open open force fields, the tools are out there and you, you'll be able to hear about that this afternoon with Richard Gowers. And you'll be able to hear about that uh, with William Wu, our industry speaker as well. And there's a million other places where our force fields are being used. We're getting integrated into commercial toolkits. We're being integrated into open source toolkits. Uh, we had the big COVID moonshot consortium uh, the past few years, apparently. Uh, and they were using open force fields. So the, our force fields were on computers all over the world being used in huge data sets. Uh, there have been scientific papers. So yeah, in case you, you haven't started using our stuff yet, people out there are using this and it's not hard to use and it's not hard to get started. I wanted to give you an update, which is that in the past year, we've added protein support to our uh, to our ecosystem. So before our force fields were focused on small molecules and our infrastructure was focused on small molecules. But in the run up to our rosemary force field, we've been expanding out the infrastructure. We've got this FF14 SB port into Smirnoff format that you can use to parameterize proteins. And this simulation here was run using the open force field toolkit. Uh, it took 20 lines of code and about 100 seconds. And those 20 lines of code, if you don't believe me, are just there on the right. Um, we'll be talking about this more tomorrow during the infrastructure talk, but this was the culmination of effort from a whole bunch of people. And you should look forward to being, you know, to setting up protein ligand sy systems in the future in open force field. This is also going towards one of our big collaborative projects this year, which is Alchemiscale. And as I said, 
it's great. We can fit to QM, we can fit to condensed phase, but what people ultimately want to know is, does your force field work for, for energy calculations? Or at least that's what a lot of people want to know. And we've been in a working group with Open Free Energy and the Codera Lab and other stakeholders in the past year working on a large uh, free energy calculation orchestrator called Alchemiscale, which can dispatch bajillions of free energy calculations at a time. Um, and I won't go into a huge amount of detail about this because David Dotson is going to do that right before lunch. But this is a really exciting project. And it means we're going to be running a lot of free energy calculations uh, as a routine thing. It's part of just not even releasing force fields, just making candidate force fields, doing experiments with different functional forms and stuff. Uh, different types of parameters. And this is going to be a big help for us to expedite our force field release process. And so now I want to convince you that you can too, that you can get into our ecosystem and learn to use our tools, make your own workflows, and get moving on that. So here I want to highlight that in 2020, we did a survey of the advisory board and we asked them a whole bunch of things. We probably asked them too many questions, but one of the questions we asked is, hey, how is the documentation? And the answer was not very good. Um, we got uh, basically a 3.3 out of five. Uh, we had a lot of comments specifically saying, oh, I had a problem and I couldn't figure out how to solve it. Uh, I couldn't figure out how to solve it. It probably would have helped to have this in, in documentation. A lot of our people work at, or a lot of our users work at companies where they can't send us a bug report. And so the more tools we can give them and the easier we can make it to use those, the better the dividends for us. And so, uh, around that time, we hired Josh Mitchell. He's our scientific communicator, and he's got a real passion for clear, understandable, parsable documentation. And he's taken a huge amount of initiative to get the word out there, to make our documentation easily approachable. And since the time he's been here, that same question, phrased the same way to the advisory board in 2023, gave us an average rating of 4.5 out of 5. We had a, a poll kind of question asking about the quality where it you know, kind of went from bottom to top, bad to good. And everything was in the top two categories. All of the responses were, hey, these docs are hugely improved. So if you tried our docs in 2020 and you found them lacking, or if you're thinking, oh, Jesus, is this, am I going to be waiting through source code? You won't be waiting through source code. The docs are there, and you can get started. Uh, we've now got on the far left, these are what we call wayfinding docs. Now that we have a number of packages, people don't know if they want an interchange or a molecule or what, what have you. Um, Josh has put together this wayfinding figure where you can see the workflow for where the molecules go in, where the force fields go in, what comes out in what format. And you can click through these different colors to get to the documentation for that specific package or to the API for that specific thing. Uh, Josh has added a lot of kind of open eye style theory documentation. So not telling you in terms of the commands that you put in the computer, but telling you in terms of the scientific theory, what's going on in the tool. So you can understand if it's suitable for your use or why it's taking so long or, you know, anything like that. And also he's, he's updated our documentation theme. Things are clear now. You can easily pull out code blocks from other texts. You can see the arguments that go into functions. Um, people have said really nice things about the parsability of our docs since that change went in. And yeah, you should keep your ears open for more workshops that we'll be running later this year. Uh, sort of like the post translation modified protein workshop. We found that to be really successful. We found that to be a great way to engage with people. And we want to run a lot more of these sort of like micro, hey, here's a cool application. Here are the Lego blocks to put it together. Um, if you want to use it verbatim, go for it. If you want to understand the Lego bricks and put it together a different way, go for it. But this seemed to be something that was really popular and it helped get us engagement. So keep your eyes open for more workshops. And so I hope I've convinced you that our models work, that people are using them, and that you can use them too. And now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Lily to talk about what we're going to be doing in the next year. Um. Cool. Thanks, Jeff. Um, all right. So Jeff has just given a really cool view of all the amazing things that we can do with all the work that we've released so far. Um, and now I'm here to give a bit of an overview of some of the uh, new stuff that's coming out um, or that we're working on uh, in the upcoming year and a bit further into the future. Um, so these new uh, projects are going to span both science and infrastructure needs. 
Um, but I'm going to start off by highlighting those that contribute most to our core mission, which is bringing bigger and better force fields. Um, so as always, we will continue uh, incrementally improving and updating uh, what we already have, um, which so far has been a series of continuously improving uh, small molecule force fields. Um, but over the next year, uh, we plan to expand the scope of our force field substantially to cover both different domains of chemistry and uh, increase the general applicability of uh, the size, size of the molecules that uh, they can apply to. So first and foremost, uh, what we want to do is move on from small molecule world um, and enter the vast region of biopolymers, uh, starting off with proteins. So our initial goal with the next major release that we're planning, Rosemary, um, is to fit a single self-consistent force field containing parameters for both small molecules and proteins. Um, uh, this has been one of the biggest projects that we've been working on over the past few years, and it's been spearheaded by Chapin. He will talk, in, uh, talk about this in a lot more detail tomorrow afternoon. Um, but I'm hoping here to just give a bit of an idea of how much work we've already put into it and uh, roughly where we are in terms of progress. So using our infrastructure, Chapin has uh, successfully generated um, a series of new quantum chemistry data sets to both train and benchmark uh, a next generation force field. These data sets have largely focused on profiling key torsions in proteins, both the backbones and the side chains. Um, and now that they're generated as part of our open philosophy, they're up online for everyone to use um, and work with as Jeff and Josh will demonstrate in the infrastructure uh, presentation tomorrow. Um, so using this data, Chapin has been able to fit several force field candidates, um, which fall into a couple of different categories to make sure that we're improving as much as possible. Um, these would be the null model, uh, which is the force field uh, fitted with this additional quantum chemistry data, but without uh, additional protein parameters. So using the same parameter specifications as in our most recent small molecule force field, SAGE 2.1. And the specific model, which is um, which does contain several additional protein-specific torsions. Uh, each of these force field candidates is benchmarked on both um, small molecule and peptide uh, targets um, with various QM uh, metrics based on QM targets, like the relative complement energies, torsion profiles, and optimized geometries that Jeff has already uh, gone through. Um, and we look at performance on, on both data sets. Uh, What's interesting is that um, the performance on the general small molecule QM targets is mostly equivalent to say, which seems really good, success, yay. Um, but the torsion profiles for the peptides in particular can show large mismatches in QM. So this has been a large part of the project so far is, uh, run, is fitting one of these protein force fields, uh, benchmarking, looking at the problems, and then going back through the process, um, refitting, uh, and exploring different settings, like uh, using different weights for the data, um, starting off with different priors, and possibly fitting to additional um, quantum chemistry data that we generate as needed. So I'll let Chapin talk more about this tomorrow. I won't steal all this thunder, um, but just as a taster, I might give an idea of how the current protein force field candidates are doing. Um, so these QM benchmarks are all very well and good but mostly what people care about, you know, are simulation properties. So the other benchmarks that we use to evaluate the force fields include predicting NMR observables and protein stability over long simulations. So on the left here, I have a graph um, uh, uh, comparing uh, the predicted NMR observables to experimental values for three different force fields. On the left, we have um, AMBER 14 SP. Um, and in the middle, we have our two different null and specific protein force field candidates. So initially, it looks like we have a long way to go. Both of the open FF candidates perform worse than AMBO on NMR observables. And um, the story actually gets worse if you look at the RMSD trajectories, because uh, these upticks in RMSD, oh, can you see my mouse? Uh, I'm trying to move my mouse over this, but can you see it? Um, oh, that screen is to the left of the screen. Oh, okay. So is it visible over there? Oh, yeah, you can just use it. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Um, uh, so these uptakes in RMSD um, of 
a long time scale simulation of a protein show that uh, a helix, an alpha helix, unwinds in one trajectory of both of the protein force field candidates that we're looking at. Um, so yeah, the story is not great so far, but what's really interesting is that, whoops, um, if you replace our canonical water model, tip 3 p uh, with a foresight water model, OPC, the, o the open FF candidates become much more competitive. Um, so on the left with the NMR observables, one of the uh, force field candidates, the, the null model with OPC water, um, actually achieves comparable performance with 14 SD. Um, and uh, Chapin has also conducted uh, additional long time scale simulations with proteins and OPC water, and so far uh, has not observed any helix sunlighting. Um, so this is maybe indicative that the problem is not so much with uh, the parameters that we fitted, but potentially with uh, the water model that we're using. So that brings me to our next project goal with Rosemary, um, to add self-consistency with water and ion parameters by co-optimizing our own water model and, and ions. Um, so up until now, we've been using the tip 3 p water model inherited from Amber, um, but that has a lot of problems that we kind of already knew, starting with the fact that it was developed um, with short range electrostatic uh, cutoffs instead of, uh, and, and not for use with PM simulations. Um, so we've been thinking for a while now that possibly we should be refitting our water model. Um, for example, we saw that when we refit Van der Waals parameters in SAGE, uh, that the enthalpy of mixing um, of aqueous structures um, improved slightly, but remained systematically overestimated. So that suggests that the common factor here, the water model, uh, might have room for improvement. Um, added to that, the fact that oh, Chapin's candidates, post candidates get much better results with OBC, despite all the parameters being fit to tip through here, um, suggests that uh, this might be the next best direction to go for improving. Uh, um, right, so yeah, um, we're refitting the water models because we think there's a lot of room for improvement there. Um, so that should come out as part of the Rosemary line, um, hopefully with or right after the initial release of Rosemary. Um, and after that, we're hoping to improve our force fields um, along an electrostatics pathway. So we plan to expand our, elect uh, our electrostatics treatment in two ways. Um, and the first way is again within the Rosemary force field line with the addition of neural network charges. Um, so up until now, we've been using the AM1 versus C charge model to assign electrostatics parameters to our, force, to, to our molecules with our small molecule force fields. Um, and that's worked pretty well. Um, but AM1 versus C is a method that uses semi-empirical calculation to come up with the original AM1 charges. So realistically, this really limits the scope of the molecules that we can address to a couple of hundred atoms at best. Um, so if we want to work with proteins, we're going to need a way to assign charges efficiently. And a neural network model allows us to assign self-consistent charges to both small and large molecules. Um, as you can see here, uh, with one of the prototype models that we have here, um, we achieve efficiency scaling orders of magnitude better than um, a full-on open eye AM1 PCC calculation. Another advantage of using a neural network is that uh, we can design the network to avoid to ignore the molecular geometry so that we avoid the dependence on the complement geometry inputs that you might get with, uh, with AM1BCC or other QM-based charge models. So our initial goal, because we are uh, releasing this as a drop-in replacement for Rosemary, is to fit our charges to replace AM1BCC. Uh, that being said, we're not limited to uh, only considering AM1BCC. Once we release our initial product, this paves the way for improving the level of theory um, to possibly higher levels of uh, chemistry well, theory. Um, so we've been working on this over the past year or two, uh, and we have now achieved models that do perform uh, similarly to our existing methods for calculating m one pcc charges. So we're quite confident that we will be able to release this um, as a, a minor update to Rosemary um, soon after the initial release. Um, as Jeff mentioned, uh, the infrastructure team has been hard at work putting together uh, a ways to use graph charges. Um, so now that we have the infrastructure in place for people to play with, um, uh, it's up online in the most 
recent OpenFF toolkit release. Uh, this is a caveat. Um, this is very much a prototype model. This is not the most up-to-date model that we have. Um, and that's why it's, it's wrapped in all these private modules with private handlers. Um, but as demonstrated in the infrastructure talk tomorrow, you should be able to assign uh, partial charges to proteins using this. Um, and in less than a minute, in the case of the GB3 protein. Um, so that's Rosemary. I want to now talk about uh, another really exciting direction that we're going into in the upcoming year, which is expanding electrostatics by adding virtual sites. Um, virtual sites are now one of the top priorities that we have for improving small molecule parameters. Uh, we know that it's difficult for classical fixed charges to properly represent the electrostatic surface around a molecule um, uh, to the level of detail needed. So for example, this is uh, a method bromide. And on the left here, we have the uh, QM electrostatic potential surface computed at HF631G star. And you can see a signal hole here around, around the bromine. Um, with classical M1B CC fixed, charge, fixed charges, uh, this signal hole disappears. There's just no real way to represent it without adding um, a virtual offside particle. So, uh, and, and we know that this failure to represent the ESP properly does result in close systematic errors in simulation properties like um, solvation free energies. So our goal is to create a virtual site. Um, we will initially fit it uh, to the electrostatic potential or the electric field at hfc 31 g star. Um, this is going to specifically target low hanging fruit and no problems, no problems, such as the sigma holes that I just illustrated. Um, and we've already got a pilot study suggesting that um, this should uh, improve our parameters and performance substantially. Um, this will be a fairly large project. We will have to uh, generate a swathe of UQM data and possibly more experimental uh, um, physical property data to both fit and validate against. Um, and much like with the graph charges, uh, we are initially fitting to HF 61 g star, but we're definitely looking forward to investigate uh, to fitting to higher levels of theory once the initial product is out. So um, the timeline for this is uncertain. We predict that virtual sites will come after rosemary, but if a virtual site is a force field is ready before then, um, we're not gonna. We are going to release it when we have it ready. So this timeline is more of a a qualitative estimate than anything definite. Um, beyond the virtual site force field, we have a lot of other exciting possibilities on the horizon. Um, there are projects like automated chemical perception, um, fitting the surrogate model in, moving towards a general neural, uh, neural network force field, um, incorporating polarizability and exploring alternate functional forms. Um, sorry. Um, and a lot of the talks tomorrow will cover these topics. So if you're interested, please do come to the Open FF room and, and have a listen. Um, but the problem with having all these really cool things going on is that we have limited time and resources. So the question becomes, which feature do we prioritize? Um, at what point do we investigate in major updates and, and changes to infrastructure? And at what point do we, uh, does a feature make it into a force root release? So at OpenFF, one way that we can classify these, these features is by putting them into three different bins. Um, on the left, we have the newest ideas and the newest size. These, these could be really cool, but um, they're still too new to know if they'll actually uh, pay off. In the middle, um, we have ideas that have been a bit more fleshed out that the, um, the consortium or the staff members can start putting effort into. Um, and then on the right-hand side, we have the things that OpenFF has fully committed to, to both bringing and maintaining for its users. And that would include uh, user-facing functionality and, and core deliverables. So what we need here is a way to both assign um, features into these bins and then a way for features to move between them so that we can work out exactly how much effort and how to prioritize uh, new features coming up. And so that's why one of the major projects in the infrastructure um, track coming up is bringing together this generalized benchmarking suite um, to the OMS staff members to start off with and then to general users. So um, the goal of the generalized benchmarking suite is to make it easier to both implement and run benchmarks on your work. 
Um, this package is, is going to be designed with a modular plugin architecture um, and incorporate multiple different data sources, be able to work with many different uh, arbitrary alternate, alternate functional forms um, and work with a number of different analyses. So we're already well into phase one, um, which uh, will start by implementing this architecture and then follow up by um, including CISO one style industry benchmarks, as well as the safe release benchmarks, followed by phase two, where we may run a second season of benchmarking, um, but the main focus will be on, sorry, on expanding usability. Um, and usability is a major theme of the infrastructure focus for this year. So a lot of effort here um, this year will center around making interchange more usable, um, expanding the range of importers that will include to incorporate uh, simple Amber, Charm, and Gromax systems. Um, and we'll also look at improving the user experience in protein within workflows. Uh, in the toolkit, we'll expand our polymer loading infrastructure to support DNA, RNA, user-defined custom substructures, and so on. We'll also support loading from formats like PDBX and MMSIF um, and similar formats. And finally, now that Josh has done such an amazing job with package-specific documentation, uh, the main focus for improving um, the infrastructure there will be to centralize it all in an area and start developing um, uh, centralized cross package workflows. So, uh, yeah, all in all, we have a busy but exciting year ahead of us, um, bringing, breaking into new domains of chemistries, um, exploring more electrostatics, and making our products both easier to use and evaluate. So, with that, I'll pass back to David to wrap up. All right, so I'm uh, just going to try to wrap up uh, quickly here. Um, you know, to, say, to kind of summarize, um, OpenFF seems to already be competitive, probably the, the best public small molecule force field. And it, uh, we think the 2.1, which we just released, is going to be better for some applications. Um, the, so here's binding free energy calculations with it, it's in, with 2.0 and some other methods. The 2.1 release, as you've heard and you can hear more about tomorrow, has made um, some improvements to the fitting process that actually improve accuracy relative to QM and we think make it a better force field in general. Uh, some of those, those improvements are about how we fit and then a lot more are about details of chemistry and fixing problem cases. One of the interesting things is we have better initial guesses for parameters now. They come straight from quantum rather than starting from a previous force field. And um, in addition, independent assessment agrees that we're making headway or essentially we, we had previously built out a benchmarking infrastructure that allowed pharma and industry to run benchmarks on proprietary chemistry internally and then report back essentially anonymized performance statistics. And so that showed more or less the same thing that um, uh, that performance is improving from one version to the next. On the top is looking at some error, structural and energetic error metrics um, by bin and for our force fields versus including GAF and, and OPLS4, which is the, the industry competitor. And so our force fields are making progress um, in that. And at the bottom, it, that's the top one is for public data. Uh, the bottom is for proprietary data where they only reported back anonymized performance statistics. So you can see that in the paper, but we're making clear headway and this was an independent assessment. So we're excited about where we're going. As I said earlier, I think at some level, we're, we still feel like we're just getting going because there are things like virtual sites that we already know are going to improve force field accuracy and we want to get those into a force field as soon as it makes sense to do so, although that will break some downstream things like uh, binding free energy calculations with some tool sets. Um, and as you've heard, we're headed towards a consistent biopolymer force field. We are pretty small. So there's the initiative, which is everybody doing everything that relates regardless of their funding source. Um, and part of that is, is funded by the National Institutes of Health. Um, we, but the consortium part, which is the industry funded part, really is roughly speaking, these five people on the left, and some of them are fractional. I think we have really a small fraction of David Dodson, who you'll hear from later. Um, so it would be great to have 
a little bit more. Uh, so we are continuing to actively recruit partners if you if you know anybody who wants to join us. Um, on the initiative, there's there's too many people doing related research picture all of them. There are a couple of changes. Pavan Bahara, who was a key person on the quantum chemistry side, has moved to a permanent position. Um, and I'll be still giving us some advice for a while. And so we have probably two new people in the QM data set, QM fitting and data set side coming in. And um, also we have a new project manager, James Eastwood, who will be starting soon, who's gonna be shared with Open Free Energy. Anyway, we, we wanna thank everybody who supports Open Force Field, um, the NIH and the consortium. Uh, we really appreciate all the, the farmer partners and industry partners, both past and present. Um, there's a big list up on openforcefield.org and the team and the alumni. It's a great community of people. Um, Virginia Tech provided initial hosting through MOLSI and then OMSF now. It's really been great working with MOLSI on this and being part of helping for, uh, with OMSF on this and being part of, part of helping to get OMSF going. And we're excited about the ongoing interactions with Open Free Energy, that's been great as well. And in some sense, we stand on, on the groundwork laid by the Amber community in the past, um, in the 80s and 90s, so we appreciate that work as well. So thanks very much for your attention, and um, we probably have time for a couple questions. <laughs>